Welcome to another episode of New Tech People Podcast. On today's episode, we have Jacqueline Garrett from GGWP Academy. Welcome, well Jacqueline. Done. <laughs> GGWP, I was trying to practice. I was practicing before you come in and get rolling off the tongue. What does GGP, GGWP Academy stand for? Uh, good game, well played. Oh. It's kind of like the hashtag or the or the prompt or or whatever you would type into the game uh, or into your comms when you're playing another person. So you know, at the end of a match or at the end of a game, you might type GG or GGWP, which gives us a bit of an insight into who you are, what you do. Exactly, Give people, the audience, <laughs> for those who don't know who you are, you are uh, Newcastle local. But for those who don't know who GGWP are, could you give us a bit of an update? Yeah, so GGWP Academy is an e-learning and influencer marketplace platform for gamers globally. So what that really means is that we teach people to become YouTubers or Twitch streamers or um, or Facebook gaming streamers, and then we give them opportunities via our marketplace to work with brands from all over the world. That's phenomenal. And I know a little bit of the backstory, but for those that don't know how uh, GGWP came about, I don't imagine you just fall into, uh, you know, creating a marketplace or an influencer, you know, platform from scratch. Can you give people, you know, understanding of, you know, where this come from? Yeah, for sure. So my son at the age of nine started, well, he was playing Pokemon from five onwards. And this is just in local competitions, at, you know, good game or, you know, wherever uh, on his DS. And so he started to qualify for bigger and bigger competitions, whether it be Oceanics or, you know, whatever. And then he was invited to the World Pokemon Championships. Wow. And the first one, I believe, was Anaheim that he went to. Uh, and, con- and and over the next three years, we went to Nashville and then Washington as well. So, yeah, he went to three World Championships in, in Pokemon. And as part of him being signed to an esports team uh, so that they would pay for his travel and everything else, it basically meant that he had to start creating content on YouTube. Yeah. And through doing that, I realized that there was a massive uh, fragmented industry here that was, you know, there was this big gap that nobody was really playing in and it seemed like a really interesting place. And I really wanted to add a layer of education, professionalism, and structure to the world of gaming influence. It's been a little bit of the Wild West over the last five, seven years, and uh, I can't wait to change that. Yeah, especially when you've got kids, as you said, by the age of nine, who are then uh, mandated to create content online in the, you know, the big wide world of social media can be a bit dangerous, I imagine, and as you said, the Wild Wild West. Yeah. And I mean, at nine or even at 18, necessarily, you don't know what it means to build a personal brand. You don't know what it means to engage an audience or to grow that audience. Uh, So unless you've been to uni or or done it previously or gone to TAFE or learnt it, you know, through your job or something like that, it's not necessarily a skill that you're, you know, that you come out of school learning. So I really wanted to teach people things like, you know, personal branding and social media 101 and stuff like that. Yeah, then I imagine maybe the dark side but the, the trolls mm. and you know at, at, at a very impressionable age being attacked online would be massive yeah huge uh one of the one of the things i learned very very quickly about managing my son's accounts online was the amount of trolls that will say literally anything to a nine-year-old so uh and i always had to keep my emotions in check but um uh, deal with those things fairly swiftly and and yeah yeah, it's disgusting. That, <laughs> it is. It, um, yeah, it means there's an obvious need there mm. to, you know, manage that or help with that yep. or educate, to your point. Mm. So your son's having some success online. You see an opportunity there. How was GGWP created or formed? So in 2018, uh, as a non-technical founder, I founded GGWP. So I did that by writing 20 modules of training. And that was all on the social media side and on the personal branding side. And I put all of that together. I started pitching accelerators uh, because being a solo founder, you need to obviously find someone who can build the product, who can, you know, join this journey. So I had to really uh, build up that narrative. I had to start showing that there was a market for this uh, and get some funding under my belt so that I could find the right people and attract the right people. Uh, I was accepted to the lead sports accelerator in Berlin. And that was only two months after founding GGWP just by myself. I just pitched, you know, online. I think I did about eight hours worth of pitching to get on onto that accelerator. 
and that was in Berlin. So uh, went to Berlin for the second half of 2018, left the family at home, as you do, <laughs> and um, came back with a very clear understanding of what I needed to do to uh, get the next lot of funding, find my co-founders, and start building this product. So I continued to build out the, uh, the education piece, uh, but when I came back, I was actually doing some mentoring uh, and and uh, helping people out in the Sydney Startups Facebook group. Which is a pretty engaged group, actually. It is actually a really good group for startups. Um, and I was just offering assistance in terms of pitch decks and, you know, things that I knew really well that I could help other people with. And I've, I, I met Cassie and John, and they were working on a traditional sports app that would find talent and match people and, and stuff like that. And after about a month of getting to know their startup and, and them, we realized pretty quickly that we were building a very similar product, that our that our skills were really complementary to each other. I mean, John is a fantastic CTO. Uh, he comes from the background of freelancer and spaceship. Yeah, right. Uh, and then you've got Cassie, who has previously worked on um, a number of different um, early stage startups, uh, including freelancer and spaceship. Wow. <laughs> so um, they knew each other early on um, and it just worked out that we happened to be building very similar products, very different industries, but that with them being both gamers, it worked out really well. I, I was able to convince them, you know, that our industry was in a massive state of growth while theirs was kind of in decline, unfortunately, yeah. uh, for traditional sports, but yes. Nice. So you've uh, then found your technical co-founders I assume and then gone about building the product from the ground up yes so they stayed on full-time at their jobs uh, for the next uh, year and a half uh, and it wasn't until uh, so John is the CTO Cassie is a CMO yeah. even though she also acts as an operational manager but we moved very quickly into um, Startmate, which yep. was in 2021. And we once we got a little bit of funding behind us, uh, pre-seed funding we did with Flying Fox and Scale Investors and, um, and Startmate. And at that point, we brought them on full time. And from there, it's just been really, really quick. So it took us a little while to get going, coming from that non-technical background. Uh, and really... I think we kind of needed that because the industry was still very much e even forming and still in its infancy very much so. Now we have a very clear understanding of what the industry looks like and even what it's going to look like for the next, you know, five, ten years and how we can be of, of service to that industry. Beautiful. A uh, couple of aspects that I want to pull <laughs> apart. In particular, working on what would have been a side hustle for them, I guess, whilst working a full-time job, trying to get something from side hustle to full-time job. Was the, the, the ticking point the the funding that came in that allowed you to go or allowed the, the other co-founders to go from side project to jumping all in? Pretty much. Yeah? yeah. And was there any advice that you could give to other people that are currently operating in a side project type of way? Because mm. that's how a lot of startups, you know, start, right? No Absolutely. One, unless you've got a, a heap of money behind you from somewhere else, a lot of people do have to work a full-time job and have their side hustle and play with that early mornings, late at night. Yeah. Any advice for people to, you know, keep that going whilst in the side hustle phase or, or, or then make that transition? The momentum or the or the want? Because they're very different things. You can you can build up momentum, you can make a personal brand that says, you know, X, Y, and Z, but having the want to keep on going is really just knowing uh, your own passion and and how you can be of service to that industry. So knowing that what you're going to do is changing that industry and having that kind of that level of passion, I think is insanely important for an early stage startup to succeed. Uh, if, if you don't have that, it becomes very difficult, I, I would say, to be um, to keep motivated, to keep on going back and back to something that isn't necessarily earning you money or, or going anywhere right at that moment. Yeah, that's a big point, actually. Um, I feel like yeah, everyone has an idea to start with and is really motivated to, you know, run through a brick wall for it, right? Yeah, but, but do it for two years while you're not being paid. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the, the key point of difference for you was the fact that it was so close to your heart with your son being yes. in that industry? Yeah. yeah. I do think that that's a clear differentiator. And also that we just knew the industry so well. Uh, our network was already in it. You know, my whole family was a part of the gaming industry. We were going to came, gaming cons. And even through COVID, I mean, you could see just how um, wildly useful gaming was to people through COVID. Yeah. Uh, our industry actually soared through the roof 
uh, in COVID. Yeah. So it was an and interesting that, time. <laughs> yeah, on that point, I think um, I'd be keen to get your opinion on it. Gaming, I think, can be viewed through two different lenses sometimes. Some people can view it as antisocial mm. because people are just playing games online instead of being outside and playing with friends, etc. But on the flip side of that, it actually opens up communication channels for people that don't otherwise find communication with other people very easily. Can to get your opinion on sort of how that's changed, your view on the market? Yeah, correct. So it is. it has been insanely useful for people who uh, suffered with mental health or, you know, being too lonely and, and stuff like that through COVID. But I think it's highlighted a, a whole range of other things. I think that there's a study out there that shows that when a young girl games – she is three times more likely to go into a STEM career. Yeah, right. So I, I think that when you can show stats like that, you begin to see just how useful gaming is to someone in their problem solving, in their communication skills, all of these other ranges of skills that you wouldn't necessarily get. So I would argue that, you know, in with everything in life, uh, whether it be, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever else, you're going to look at that that very small percentage, well, maybe not so small, but, you know, smaller percentage that is having an issue with addiction and stuff like that. Uh, the same goes for gaming. There is definitely a gaming addiction. Um, you know, the World Health Organization has dictated so. So, you know, we go with that definition. But I, I think the number that it actually applies to is well below 1% of yeah. the gaming market. Yeah. So you've got to look at the good versus bad you know there's always going to be somebody who's negatively affected by something but i think you've also got to look at these major uh positive effects that it can have on a person's you know um confidence and and career paths going forward yeah correct i think yeah two things that right there the career paths being one is it's creating new careers and new opportunities yeah. for people outside of traditional you know traditional career paths but the second part as well probably ties into you know, what you're doing, the educational piece around mental health and, you know, things you can do to potentially alleviate that. I mean, you're not going to fix all of the problems, but that educational piece can definitely be uh, something that helps in this market, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, nice. So um, the story today then, you've obviously, you've grown off the ground, you've got some co-founders on board, you've gone through an accelerator program or international accelerator program, got some funding uh, locally here in Australia. Um I imagine like the, the industry continues to evolve, you continue to evolve. Does that bring us to where we're at today? Where are you at currently? What's next for GGWP? Yeah, pretty much. So right at the moment, I mean, if you look at our product, uh, we have 90 plus videos showing people how to build their personal brand, how to do their social media, even how to do accounting for freelancers. Yeah. So it's down to that kind of level. Um, and we have a product whereby a brand can come and list a gig on the platform, much the same way as a job would be listed and influencers can apply to represent. So, so that's a, a, a product that they'd like to have an uh, one of the gamers sell or promote. Yeah. So right. Casio watches came to us and said, we've got a Pac-Man watch that we'd like to sell. Yeah. And so they brought us a product. They gave us a budget. We went out and worked with a number of different influencers and we actually sold out that product within a week in Australia. Yeah. Wow. And so, and, and that was, you know, the only uh, marketing campaign that they actually put together for that particular watch so yeah, we wow. know that it was well effective uh and that's one of the things we're really trying to prove out is that the smarter that an influencer is the higher the roi on these marketing campaigns because that that's what brings all of these brands back yeah to gaming uh and why we wanted to add the professionalism and structure and everything else because we could see you know there were literally hundreds of millions of dollars coming into gaming in this way yeah. Uh, to work with influencers and there was no one really sort of uh, facilitating this um, this exchange. Yeah, well, I think that the big point there as well is those micro-influencers, right? Like I think the Red Bulls of the world are going to, you know, sponsor maybe the top, you know, very small percentage, but those micro-influencers, it's, it's the same in gaming as everything else in the world, right? Micro-influencers, there's a big market there yeah. of hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars being poured into those markets that somebody with, you know, a couple of, you know, I don't know, hundreds or, you know, thousands of followers can actually have a big influence. Absolutely. We work. That's actually where we play the, the hardest is the other 99%. Yeah. That top 1% of brands and top 1% of influencers, that's – you know, kind of already organized by agencies fine. and stuff like that. What we're really interested in is the other 99% and creating that creator economy from the ground up so that everyone can be a part of this 
um, this economy, it means that startups can engage us for as little as five thousand dollars yeah. to get their name out globally with influencers, uh, yeah. you know, via gaming. Uh, it means that we can work with everyone on the way up to that top one percent, um, and that you know, not only does uh, everyone get a go, so to speak, but it also means that. You know, brands can uh, engage and get as much out of this as possible. And I think the really cool thing about this is that we can work with so many different and diverse types of brands. We can work with VPNs. We can work with fintech providers. We can work with fashion uh, sneakers. Uh, <laughs> we've worked with, as I said, Casio watches, Indomie noodles, uh, Logitech. Just so many different brands across, you know, every ecosystem. And I guess, you know, the technology that we're building out is really changing ad tech. Yeah. It's really moving into that wider piece about uh, we're qualifying influencers for the first time. Yeah. We're actually showing that, you know, these people, the people on our platform are smarter. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They didn't get there by luck. Yeah. And they know how to represent your brand and get you, you know, really great ROI on your campaigns. Yeah, right. So you've got the educational part for, you know, obviously influence themselves. So they do a better job of building their brands. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, you've also got the the ad or the marketing model, which can help companies, you know, find the right influencers to support their brands. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. What I love about that also is, uh, you know, brands and marketing dollars are no longer just spent for, you know, pure branding. You know, they, they want to look at their attribution models. It's not just models. brand awareness anymore. Correct, right? They want to look at their attribution models and they're quite smart about, you know, where marketing dollars go now. And if yep. you can actually tie that into, as you said, the influencers that can, you know, can actually get it, you know, show their ROI on the spend or, or you know, um, how that how that plays out for the company, you're differentiating yourself than the rest of the market. Hugely, and I guess w when we talk further about the the technology and the the more legacy piece that we're building on the other side of this immediate marketplace that we're building, uh, we're talking about the alignment of brands. So we're we're also talking about you know how do we utilize AI to build an engine that will align both sides of that market. Yeah, wow. So we're looking at things like like Red Bull, for instance, is an adventurer style archetype, yep. uh, you know, in, in branding. And so if we can match Red Bull or that particular archetype with an influencer from the same uh, from the same place, uh, from the same archetype, it means that the cut through and the ROI is going to be so much higher. Yeah. Because that audience is already set up for that message. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And that's when you get some smarts around the marketing that really yes. differentiates yourself than the rest of the market. The the path today, obviously, uh, you're at a point now where you've got a platform, you've got users, you've got brands. What's next? What's or well, A, what's next? And then B, what's a greater vision? Like what's the end game? Yeah, look, um, I might start with the end vision. <laughs> For us, it's it's really about that that education structure and and uh, professionalism for the gaming industry. That's the first and, and foremost of what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, we also want to make sure that brands can get the ROI and get the, you know, exactly what they came for out of the gaming industry. In a wider, wider sense, that also means that the technology that we're building at the moment is going to be licensable or whitelistable um, yeah. out to other influencer marketing uh, or marketplaces all over the world. So we, we anticipate this to be not only uh, for gaming, but to go out to the verticals like beauty, fitness, lifestyle, travel. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of the plan within the next five years. Uh, we've actually got a very um, uh, well-detailed plan <laughs> that, that gets us there. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited to implement that over the coming uh, years. Uh, but at the moment, we are actually crowdfunding. So we've previously raised 1.125 mil mm -hmm. uh, with great uh, investors like Flying Fox, uh, Scale Investors, um, as well as um, smaller angels as well across the ecosystem. But now we're looking to crowdfund. We've engaged our community and really wanted to show product market fit through this. Yeah. Uh, and we've raised 393,000 to date uh, just over the last two weeks with our community. Yeah. So I think that that's a great teller. Um, of what our community thinks of our product. And now we're, we're taking it out to investors and, and angels and other business people to participate over the next seven days in our crowdfund. Yeah, wow. So we've got seven days from today, yeah. which is October. <laughs> 
20th. So we've got uh, October 27th of closes. Uh, we'll try and get this podcast out <laughs> ASAP to try to give our community an opportunity to actually have a look in this. Um, for those who want to potentially get involved, uh, I imagine there's just a simple link they can click on for more information. Yeah. We're on Equitize. So yeah. if you simply go to the Equitize uh, equity crowdfunding platform, yeah. you'll see us pretty quickly cool. there. Nice. I think we had Mike from Decky on recently, maybe also went through Equitize. Yep. So we'll share that link in our show notes as well and any social media posts that we do. Um, for the vision next five years for people that are willing to get involved or wanting to get involved or a little bit more interested, what's what's this current raise? What's that allow GGWP? allowed them to do so we've gone with a min max uh, we have to on any crowdfunding platform yeah. so we've gone with a min max of 350 to 1.2 yeah. the sweet spot is really that 550 uh, k yeah. uh, that we're looking to get our next 12 months of runway out of yeah. this will allow us to build uh, what we're calling the mvp of the next you know phase of our business it basically means that we can um, streamline automate uh, this means payments it means a brand experience it means that a brand can come build a profile they can search for talent it means that every time that they do a campaign they can get post campaign reporting automatically sent to them so there's all of these things that we're looking to really provide the brand side now okay. so that we can start to build that out and make sure that everything we're providing brands is what it should be because we've done the user side we know that they need the the education and the gigs and yeah. all of these features but now we need to build out that brand side the payments between them um and really just automate everything that we've been doing manually for the past two years yeah nice does that uh, include building out the team in any capacity it certainly does what's that team look like for the next couple of hires for you yeah so the next two hires that we anticipate to make are going to be salespeople. yeah um because we know now uh with our one salesperson what we can do now it's time to really bring up that revenue uh side of things and we plan to do that in the u.s nice. uh we've got a, a number of brands that we need to onboard from the u.s and we need someone on the ground there to do that we've actually just started advertising for that role wow. um we're going to be doing a little bit i would say you know just in these early stages there's going to be some outsourcing in terms of you know software developers and stuff like that it's not really the way that we wanted to build our team we wanted to build it out you know with solid full-time members and really grow but with the market the way that it is we've decided that we need to do it this way now and move really quickly so that's kind of where we're at now we're going to be outsourcing our our tech team and um hiring some sales people with your US. cto internally managing that right so managing yeah. the build yeah nice yeah. so you still have got that internal capability as well yeah. Beautiful. I imagine salespeople in the US and the gaming world, uh, that might be an exciting hire for you. Like from a recruitment perspective, uh, that's a pretty easy sell, right? I come join a, a company that's working both brand and influencer side in the gaming community. Surely that's uh, going to be a pretty popular role. It is, but I tell you what, when you tell people, you know, what the pay might be that you're, you know, lo looking to use some equity or, you know, commissions and things like that, it can, it can change things a little bit, especially when there's so much money in startups in the US. Yeah. So um, we're really relying on our network at the moment to help us with referrals. And, you know, obviously we need someone who already has a, a little black book of, yeah. <laughs> of brands, of connections. So we're really trying to whittle it down. Uh, I think... We opened it up and I think in the first day we had 92 applicants. Yeah, nice. So it's, it's flowing through really nicely at the moment. I think the hard part is going to be more about just finding the right, the right person, person from it, of course. Nice. You mentioned something there, the US and Australia. I think uh, it's an interesting piece for anyone in Newcastle, but anyone in Australia in general, finding money. Mm. Um, is more difficult in general even over the past the past six months even worse but how have you found that experience being a, a startup founder based here in australia versus potentially being based in the us oh look i i have colleagues and peers in the us who are you know starting their own gaming startups and they can pull you know two and three times our valuation over there uh, and and pull together a, a two million dollar seed round very very quickly and easily. I, I'm yet to see a friend over there who hasn't been able to do it. <laughs> in fact, um, so I think that being in a more regional area like Australia for gaming in particular has been a really interesting road. In the beginning, we found that we had to educate investors and even tell them what it meant to be a part of the gaming or esports worlds. Yeah. 
Um, so we were doing more education than we were asking for money. Yeah. <laughs> we were just exceptionally lucky that we um, that we managed to get to know Matt Allen, yeah. who's in the space at Tractor Ventures, um, and he introduced us to Kylie Fraser from um, to uh, Flying Fox, then Eleanor, and uh, Chelsea at uh, Scale. Uh, both of those groups uh, support more heavily on female founders. Yeah. And, you know, being run by women, of course, they could see that we're in a really weird position. We're in a heavily male-dominated field. Uh, female founder, you know, it, it was always going to be a bit of a long, hard road. <laughs> yeah. So we can't wait to get past this next point because this next value inflection point for us is going to mean that we have a product that is – completely different from anything in the market it's it's completely undeniable at that point you yeah. know if we if we build exactly what we say we're going to build in the next 12 months it will just surpass anything on the market so i i think that when we reach that kind of a point there's no denying it that's when we can go to investors in the us and be you know uh i mean we've always been fairly confident yeah but now it's like here it is like this is literally it it's done we're not talking about it anymore we're changing the game yeah, we expect the the investment to change dramatically from there. Beautiful. I'll stick on that uh, US point for one more bit. Do you think at some point in time that you're going to have to move to the US? There will definitely be a part of our uh, company that has to be in the US. Uh, there's no denying that. Whether I'm in the US is is a totally different, but a totally different question. However, I anticipate that there will be a point where I need to be there on the ground a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. On the flip side of that, are there some positives being in Newcastle or in Australia? What's kept you local to Newcastle um, and, and growing the business here in Australia? I love the lifestyle in Newey. Yeah. Um, I like being able to go to the beach. You know, if it's in, in the middle of the Christmas school holidays, you know, my, my husband might drive us up to Port Stephens. So I'll be working in the car for that hour, you know, 45 minute drive yeah. and get out and, you know, go do stuff with the family and then work on the way home. So I love the lifestyle that it allows us. And more and more so you're seeing the, the ecosystem change in terms of talent and that talent grow and stay more local. Uh, you know, I think that five, 10 years ago, it was a very different story and now with more and more exciting startups staying in newcastle you're starting to see the talent stay here a bit better as well so i think that that's really exciting i can't wait to see how we can grow that here as well uh, but i mean primarily my team works remotely so i yeah. work with you know most of my team are in sydney but yeah. i'm here in newcastle yeah uh the, the ability to speak to other founders and you know bounce off them i feel is grown in newcastle and you've mm. now got a few people that have had some successes even more so in sydney right you can bounce with other people that have been there done that i think uh once you get to that next point and you're able to then share that knowledge you know it influences both the local community here in newcastle and australia as a whole yeah. and the other point you mentioned just before female founder uh, female founders are obviously a very small group, successful female founders or just female founders in general. And there's some obvious difficulties out there uh, and challenges which make or have made your experience, I, I, I assume, much harder. Can you give some insights into, I guess, your journey to date as a female founder and then also potentially some advice that you might be able to share with others? Yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely had some interactions that would, you know, curl your toes and really make you cringe. For anyone who supports female founders, you would really cringe at some of the things that we've seen. I mean, I've been called just a mum with an idea. I've called, <laughs> you know, I've been called all sorts of things. I've been told to go and find a, a male co-founder. Yeah. I've, um, yeah, it's it's not been easy and it certainly isn't easy um, when you're fundraising. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons why most of our uh, investors are female or um, female supporting is, you know, it's it's very difficult in, in any country, um, whether whether you're here or the US, to raise funds as a, as a woman. So uh, I think that just before COVID, the percentage of global VC money that went to women was at 2.9%. And this year it's gone down to 0.7%. Uh, I was about to ask is do you think it's getting better? No, it is not. Yeah. <laughs> Very unfortunately. And uh, there are still studies out there that show that women-led startups are performing better in terms of revenue. So I don't understand why the disparity. I think that the the best advice I can give to anyone as 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 another woman would be to 
just be insanely confident, um, even if you're you're not, uh, you know, fake it till you make it, so to speak. I really hated that. And I actually had a few investors kind of say that to me, you need to fake it till you make it. And I was like, no, I'm I'm conservative. I'm I'm transparent. I'm always going to speak to you in real terms instead of blowing things up like a show pony. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, wh- when it turns out that I actually needed a little bit of that, I needed a little bit of that storytelling, a little bit more of that, um, you know, just blind confidence in yourself that sometimes you know they expect to see from men. So I think that. Um, you know, for a, a certain part of this is investors looking at a founder and expecting to see certain traits because that's what they've seen of male founders. When they've been successful, they've been overly confident. They've been this, that. Um, I think now that we need to redefine what that successful founder looks like. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't necessarily look like that show pony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a... Um- that's a sad situation and especially sad that, you know, it's not changing for the positive, you know, as quickly as any of us would have hoped. Mm. Have you found that there is a strong support network for female founders in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. There's There are men out there championing um, female founders, uh, which is fantastic to see. There are women out there, you know, starting to put together funds, uh, which is also great to see. And there are, f- there are a few existing as well. There are also accelerated programs like SBE Global, which is a springboard network for female founders to go to the US. Uh, so we've also done that program too. Um, I think that in these early stages, while we're still really trying to move the needle on funding going to women-led founders, uh, women-led uh, startups, we really need to um, stick together. I think that we we need to lean into being female founders, find the other people around us and really utilize each other's networks and, and you know, make it happen together because I feel like that's the only way it's going to move at this point. Yeah, it would, it would be nice to see, you know, if the next you know, short, sooner rather than later, yeah. um, that that trend line starts to you know, obviously change. And I think that the more, I think it's actually been proven, <laughs> don't hold me to this, but I'm fairly certain that the more you invest in women, the more they turn around and invest in more women. I was about and to I, say I can't that. wait to be on the other side and actually, you know, helping and mentoring and funding other women. I I so badly want to get to that place. Yeah, get to the place. Hey, obviously, the, the key focus for you, obviously, is go super narrow, super mm. focused on your, you're building your company first and then the opportunity to then give back to that community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Taking an idea from zero to one, super difficult. I feel like lots of people have ideas. Uh, ideas <laughs> are worth nothing, executions, everything, obviously. Truth. For anyone that's got an idea, might be working a full-time job somewhere else, but passion area, same similarity to you, um, passion area, and an idea around that passion area. Mm. Is there any advice that you would give that person? Because I feel like there's a lot of people out there in this day and age that, you know, are working a nine to five job, uh, reasonably happy, but have a passion area and have an idea around that. Can you give anyone some advice to, you know, to bring that to life? Ideate really quickly. Yeah. Constantly coming up with new and different and more effective ways of, you know, how can I package this up and sell it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, will 100 people pay for it? make it happen and then get into it. You yeah. know what I mean? So you've, you've got to find out whether it's useful, if it's not been done before, what's the differentiator. There are so many little things there that need to be sorted out really, really quickly. And then you've got to figure out if a hundred, a thousand, a million people would pay for it. Yeah. And you don't have to build that from scratch, right? You don't no. have to get a software engineer to build a full lab. You can get a no code solution or you can just do it with a, an actual ideation action. You can start with surveying your, you know, your community, then you can build a part of it. And then, you know, ask them what they think. And, you know, you can do all of these other things to figure out whether you're on the right track before you jump in two feet, no pay. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, no, completely I, I, I think that that's the start. Yeah, beautiful. Um, from that starting point going to the next, like you're managing a family, you're managing a business, fully remote business, you're managing fundraising. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to that. How do you manage your day? I'm not the average. I'll give you that. Um, being in the gaming world, it can quite often mean a 3 a.m. meeting. Yeah. So I am very, very flexible and very adaptable. My day changes every hour. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit all over the place, to be honest. Do you use a calendar for meetings? <laughs> I do, yes. So I, I use calendar for all of my meetings, obviously, but it just means that, you know, while I'm doing outreach on LinkedIn or, or whatever, it means that, you know, 
I could go from going to sleep at 8 p.m. like I, I would want to <laughs> yeah. into, you know, oh, I've got to go to bed at 6 p.m. so that I can get up and do a, a call at 1 o'clock or, you know what I mean? So, it, it really does change fairly, you know, consistently throughout the days. Yeah, right. So, calendar, obviously one tool. And then do you, are you just, uh, is there a project management tool or is it, uh, you know, do, or is it the G Suite? What, what, any other software that you use? to? We you use know, Notion for everything. Notion? Uh, in, our, in our business. It's basically our, our Wikipedia. That's where we keep everything yep. um, for the company, all of our succession planning, all of our sales, everything like that. Um, and then that ties into HubSpot for, yep. um, for you know, outreach and stuff like that. So, I would say that they're the two biggest tools that we're using internally at the moment. Yeah, nice HubSpot mm. notion. That's a nice mm. little tech stack. Yeah, it's just simple. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like HubSpot does that right. They yeah. do that really well. They 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 uh, they have a spot for founders and startups with little no budget with their free options right up to enterprise level solutions. Yeah. Right, uh, it's beautiful. Outside of that, like you've obviously gone through a journey. I feel like. A, once you get there as well, there's a lot of education you'll be able to provide others. But like for right now, is there, is there a book or a podcast or anyone that you follow that you'd really, hey, this person was a game changer or this book was a game changer for me? Mm. Um, there's there's one podcast that I do listen to a little bit. It's the Startup Playbook, yeah. um, local ecosystem startup stuff. Uh, then Atomic Habits would be the book that I would suggest to check out. Yeah. Um, I'm really... Uh, uh, again, I'm not a linear pathway on on this either, but I like to, you know, if there's a particular startup like uh, Camplify or like Canva, you know, some of those really cool stories that you just w can't get enough of, they're the ones like, you know, if they're on whatever podcast, I'll go and listen to that. So, yeah, yeah I, I tend to follow startups, not podcasts if yeah. that makes sense yeah. yeah follow the individuals and where they pop yeah. up and what you'll find is when they go the in there for a fundraising round you, they'll pop up on everyone's podcast or they got a book coming out or something like that that's no, it's really good we're trying not to take up too much of your time is there any like parting advice that you would like to provide anyone uh really a again just to go back to that female founder piece that you know if we can all bend together and i don't mind when women reach out to me i don't mind when anyone <laughs> reaches out to me but i certainly don't mind if a, if a female founder reaches out to me for advice or or help or an introduction or whatever i'm always you know there to be a part of it what's the easiest way to reach out to you on LinkedIn is yep. usually pretty quick and easy under Jacqueline Garrett. Yeah, and we'll link that the up full in our show whole notes. name <laughs> instead of Jacks. Yeah, no, I, uh, I went through that only the other day. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll link that up in the show notes to make it nice and easy for those as well. Um, so Equitize right now, uh, we're open for another seven days. Um, we'll get that out ASAP and see if people want to get involved. If they've got any more questions, I know that they, I've been through the site myself and there is a lot of information there for any potential investors, but if there's any other questions, come to you. Yes, absolutely. We've got a 40-page offer document on yeah. the platform that you can download. Uh, we also have a and a video that you can check out as well. So uh, lots of information, but otherwise, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or any of the social media platforms. Beautiful. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story on your Tech People podcast. Thank Thanks, James. Cheers. 